what I'm going to do right now is just uh, start with PD lore and then move into the uh, into modulation stuff. The, the PD lore here, the multiple voice thing, this corresponds roughly to chapter four of the book. And then when we get into modulation, that's going to be chapter five, designer spectra is chapter six, and then delays is chapter seven, and filters is chapter eight. So it's all pretty much just according to the syllabus, theoretically. Um, first thing about that is, I don't know if you guys have looked at this or not, but are there questions about how this whole thing works now? So this is a, this, what you're looking at is one of these, and in this particular situation I've avoided having leads going into, or lines, patches going into and out of the sub-patches, or connections going in and out of them. I'm, I'm using um, non-local connections everywhere, which are in the form of receive and throw tilde. So one thing that I want to do today is talk a little bit more about local and non-local connections and, and what they're good for and how you can make them. Local connections, mean, by, which, by that I mean just making lines between things in a single window and non-local connections meaning things like throw or throw and catch or send and receive. All right, I'm going to just sort of proceed by example. So the, just to remind you, the thing that is you know, most likely to be confusing to you about this patch uh, is, is an important thing to be confused about so that you can try to get unconfused about it over time, which is the, uh, which is the dollar sign mechanism and how its use spins out it differently in object boxes versus message boxes. Right, so in object boxes like this one, dollar three means uh, 0 0.56 because that's that's what was thrown this thing as arguments when it was made. Whereas in message boxes, this dollar one is whatever comes down this line because that's what is thrown to it as arguments when it's when that message is passed, which is to say when the message box is sent a message as opposed to when the thing is made. The deeper truth is that objects really are messages. These are messages that go to a special factory object, if you like, which just makes objects for PD itself. So there's actually one unified thing in PD by which messages get passed down lines and, and by which also these objects get built. And if you look a little deeper into it, you will find out that you can use that fact to make patches that change themselves and so on like that, if you care about that kind of thing. All right. Uh, That's the, that's the main bit of, of, of stuff about this that you might not have, have known before. Yeah? Um, when you're making that abstraction, mm -hmm. how would you make multiple and then some multiple objects from this abstraction? Okay. I think the next example will make that clear. And there's some funny stuff about that that I have to show you. Yeah. Actually, what, rather, actually rather than wait for the next example to make that clear, let me show you. <coughs> Let me just show you what the answer is, and then when the example comes up, you'll, you'll see it in that context. That might be better. Okay, so abstractions are a form of subpatch, right? So this thing, is, this, this window is actually inside this box, and you can make this box have inlets and outlets, and this window will, uh, will be able to get the inlets and throw things to the outlets, but you don't have to use the abstraction mechanism to make that be true. So there, there are two possible ways of having objects inside, or sorry, whole patches inside objects. One of which is this way, which is you just name a, a file. The file is named partial.pd. The other of, of them is simpler. Uh, let's see, let's make a new patch. And the simpler thing is this. Font 16, please. You can just say pd and then give it a name. <coughs> A name without any spaces in it, as usual, because in PD, spaces are delimiters between arguments. Right? And now this thing is inside this box, in the same way as, as was true with the so-called abstractions that you saw in that other example. The word abstraction refers to the fact that you are, in fact, loading a patch into a sub-window as opposed to just editing it yourself into the, into the patch that called it. So here, we can do things like this. Let's give ourselves an object and call it an inlet. And that, as soon as I made it, it made one of these things happen. And furthermore, if I make more of them, they show up uh, at 
as I'm making them. And the same is true for outlets. Oh, just to confuse matters further, uh, you can have inlets and outlets, but they can come in control and signal varieties. Uh, if, if you say inlet tilde and outlet tilde, then you uh, can put audio signals into it and get audio signals out of, of the inlets and outlets. Otherwise, you're doing messages. And you can't mix them, unfortunately. That's a limitation. So the other thing about that is, well, all right. Let's get a nice number box here. And we'll make a stupid patch, which is it just takes whatever comes in and throws it out the output. Oh, in fact, I can even do better than that. I can say oscillator 440. And I'll make that talk to this. It won't go to this one because it's an inlet, not an inlet tilde. But this one it can connect to because that's a signal one. And maybe if I have the patch. If I have a file here, I can say output. Yes. Now we've got a great little pass through a sign resoid. It doesn't work. Oh, why didn't it work? I said excited to hear you, but yeah, that's it. It's like duh. Let's do this, <laughs> and then we have a little pass through thing. Okay. Similarly here, we've got messages going in and, again, duh, but let's do it. Now we've got that going on. Now, how do you know which is which? It's stupid, but it's the only possible way you could do it. These things, uh, however they appear from left to right, is how these appear from left to right there. Yeah. Yeah. So I could do this. And now I've got sort of a little brain melt device. In fact, yeah, you can and you can do that too. Um, you know, I mean it's the only way you can really do it. It still works. In, in other words, moving things around shouldn't change how the thing functions. And the only way to not change how it functions is to sort of fix it so that it functions the same. So, so it actually switches the, the inlets and the outlets around in real time as you're moving the objects around. There's no other real way to do it. All right. Um, so that's inlets and outlets and maybe answered your question about how you figure out which is which. Um, they, they're proportionally spaced across here. There's one other little thing to know, which is this. If I said PD and then had a bunch of inlets and outlets like this. This will happen to you eventually, even if it hasn't happened yet. At some point, you get to the point where uh, it's just black with inlets and outlets. And then how do you know what you're connecting to? And the answer is really stupid. The answer is just give it a nice long argument like that so that they get spaced out. And if the name you gave it wasn't long enough, just add some hyphens to it or something to make it long enough. Someday there will be a, a way of controlling the widths, but right now it, the, widths of, the width of a box is just the width of the text that it fits into. So, this is, so if you want to change it, you just change the width of the thing. And it's, um, yeah, that's enough of that. Okay, so that's inlets and outlets and sub patches. And the other things that I want you to be able to know is that the sort of collection of new objects that we're dealing with that have to do with getting stuff into and out of sub patches. One collection of things was indeed inlets and outlets and, oh, I said tilde, but you know, inlet, outlet, and in, inlet tilde and outlet tilde. And then there is also, I've already shown you, throw and catch, which are things that set up summing buses. The place that showed up was here, inside the partial again. The last thing that happens is we throw, do a throw tilde to, and then you give it a name, which is sum. This is like delay read almost. Oh, uh, sorry, this is like um, table, making a table or making a send. This defines a thing whose name is sum. 
and then anyone who wants to can refer to it by saying catch tilde and then the word sum again. And that in this patch is done down here. Catch tilde sum and then output. All right, this can't be earthquakes. This is just vibrations of some other kind. Okay. And there's more probably which I haven't, well, which I explained last time. And you can now look it up on the DVD, so I'll repeat it. Okay. So I want to move to another example that just shows you how to arrange sub, well, arrange uh, copies of the sub patch which are made using the abstraction mechanism in, in a couple of other different ways, just to give you programming paradigms, if you like, for, or ways of, of putting things together. Um, neither, none of these is, is the sort of final answer to how you should do this. The, these are all sort of alternatives that you will find a personal style that, that uh, attracts to one or another, and so on like that. So this was, uh, this one was D07. There are, I think, two others in this series. Let's see, yeah, I'll leave that around just for, just in case. Eight. Here's a, here's a cool trick. Okay, this is an additive synthesis patch that allows you to draw a spectrum. Why doesn't this let me move it? Oh, come on. All right, got rid of that. Where are we? There, I must have miniaturized it somehow. Now, where's the... I don't know how to scroll this. So, this is not drawing a waveform, this is drawing a spectrum. So I can do this and get stuff that has plenty of high frequencies, or I can do this and get the low frequencies instead. Or if you like, I can put in formants and then I can pretend that I'm making vocal synthesis. And then vocal synthesis is more believable if it's moving around and pitch like that. Right. Okay. This is okay. So what's happening here is there must be an abstraction somewhere because we have a whole bunch of oscillators. Each one is playing a partial of this. I think there might be 36 partials in this sound. And okay, how to make this shut up? Go over here. Scroll. Ah. There's an oscillator bank, which just to be uh, on the safe side, I put in a sub patch. Well, on the safe side, on the sane side, I put in a sub patch. And it consists of an abstraction called spectrum partial, of which there are 30 voices. And what does the abstraction do? Well, what it has to do, or what it has to be able to do, is figure out what pitch it should have, and then go at, to this table and find the point which is at the pitch and figure out what its volume should be, or what its amplitude should be, I should say. Right? So what's happening here is the pitches are all determined simply by, if I know what the fundamental pitch is and I know what partial I am, I can compute my pitch. But I also want to know what my amplitude is, and the amplitude is being set by this table, which I can then change. Right? So this is a way of I don't know what, it's, it's a sort of a super Hammond organ, if you like. All right, so how would you do that? So again, we're using the throw and catch mechanism for getting the audio signals in and out and sends and receives in order to get messages in and out. And again, just as in the Bell example, we have the problem of disambiguating what we're doing so that, um, so that each one of them can do what it's can make its own partial and not have all 30 of them make the same partial. Right? So each one of them, you know, the, the one that gets the argument 25 should do the 25th partial and so on like that. So you have to be able to do that uh, using the dollar sign mechanism, that, that's to say the, the argument passing mechanism for abstractions, which is that this dollar sign one here expands to the number one, but in the window which is this next one, it will expand to two and so on like that. 
So then what are we going to do? Well, um, one little thing that I should probably say first because it's a deep detail, but it's a fundamental detail, is this. Um, you, there's no way in particular in PD that you can get told when a table changes value. It's, it's something that ought to be there, but it isn't. And so this thing does the, um, does the incorrect uh, thing, according to computer science, of polling. That's to say what it does is some number of times a second, each of the oscillators looks at the table in order to figure out what its, um, what its amplitude should be. Right. And so there's a, there, from somewhere, which I can show you later, there's a send poll table that has just a metronome sending bangs that are going out at some 30 times a second, I think. <coughs> Questions? Moses? Oh, I haven't told you Moses. Yeah, okay. I, I should have figured there'd be objects that... Uh, okay, so Moses. Here we go. We'll get the help on it. Moses is this. Uh, you put a number in, and if it's bigger than the argument, it goes out one output, and if it's less than the argument, it goes out the other. It's a reference to the Red Sea thing. And you can, you can change the value of 10 by changing this argument. So if I want to have, have 30 be the split point, I do that, and then it's things up to 30 there, and things, things 30 and more go this way, and things up to 29 go out there. And it's also floating points, so 29 and a half goes out there, but as soon as we hit 30, we'll get it out here. Okay, so that's Moses. Uh, Moses is, uh, is similar to route. Route is another thing which takes messages in and, and puts it out in a different place depending on what the message is. Uh, the, the difference is that Moses is, is restricted to only two outputs because it's a different kind of a thing, and it only takes numbers, it doesn't take entire messages. So there's Moses, which, by the way, now that I've done that, I should put on the new patches list. And this one we actually really saw today. Random, I'm not sure we'll get to yet. question. Okay, are there other objects here? No, not that I see. Oh, um, tab read, I think I told you about tab read for tilde, which is a signal object which reads tables interpolatingly. Well, you can do it with messages just by not putting the tilde there. Other than, oh, oh boy, DB to RMS, I think I told you about that. Yep, okay. So, so what happens here is this thing is getting banged 30 times a second and every Every time that happens, we're going to make a decision about what our amplitude is. Meanwhile, there is pitch to figure out, but pitch is simpler because the pitch is just what it got set to by the number box. So the pitch of this thing depends, that's this. The frequency of the oscillator, which is one partial, can be computed by looking at the pitch, which is sent from this message box out here. Pitch. Now, we were looking in the oscillator bank, and then we were looking in spectrum partial one. There's pitch coming back. And we do M to F to, to figure out what it is in hertz. But then, this oscillator is not going to play at the fundamental frequency. It's going to play at some multiple of the fundamental given by the partial number. So here, it's partial number one, so we multiply by one. But if it was partial 30, we'd multiply by 30 to figure out what the frequency really is of the oscillator we're going to play. Is this clear? One more time. One more time. Okay. So, so there are 30 of these things. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a, a sound by adding up 30 sinusoids, which will be tuned to the partials of the, of the fundamental frequency that we want. Here's the fundamental frequency. $1 is the number of the partial we're now looking at. And this number goes from 1 to 30, depending on... Uh, depending on which of these boxes we're in, in the oscillator bank. 1 through 30. And 
I'll do this later, but that's a frequency in hertz, which will go down, and all we're going to see down there is an oscillator. Oscillator time, and there's a throw that you can't see because it's scrolled off the screen. Other questions? Yeah. What does this do? Oh, yeah, I'll have to get to that. But I'll, I'll tell you in two words, and then I'll tell you in detail later. Uh, basically, silence. Zero doesn't have a good... Um, zero should go to silence and not just zero dB. So it splits zero off and makes true zero as opposed to converting. Other questions? Or just general global cloudy confusion? Yeah, uh, receive. receive. Yeah. Okay. So this is this is now going to an oscillator and, and a multiplier, which is getting multiplied by the gain of this oscillator, the amplitude of this oscillator, and then it and then there's a throw down here that you don't see. Okay. The fun part is all this stuff where we compute the what amplitude the oscillator should have. Right? And that recall, that I'm, I want to be able to draw that in a table. And so what that means is I should figure out where that oscillator should be in the table and then do a read in the table to see how high the, the, how high the thing should be above nothing, right? So how do you do that? Well, okay, so the table is not, oh, choice. This is a designer's choice. What, what should the horizontal units of the table be? Should they be hertz or should they be midi or something else? In this particular case, it turned out to be more effective or more appropriate to put it in MIDI units so that the table itself, when you look at it, is, um, is arranged by pitch, not by frequency. Why? Because if it were frequency, you'd want to you'd be using half the table just to describe everything from 2K to 4K or something like that, and then, all, and then there'd be a lot of detail in the lower parts that you wouldn't be able to see because it'd be too squashed together, so pitch is better. And I even label it here. This is, these are MIDI numbers, which are um, which are MIDI pitches. So that 60 here corresponds to 260 hertz. This stuff is all very low frequency, but up here, these are frequencies which are reasonable for four months of a vowel or something like that. In fact, I did this so that I could just play with vocal synthesis. So, so if you want to do vocal synthesis with this, you would figure out where you wanted the resonances of of of, of, of of an imaginary vocal track to be, and then you would put bumps at the points, at the frequencies of those resonances, and then you would make those be, you know, oscillators that landed at those frequencies would be louder. All right. Is that decently clear? Okay. So then, so if we want these to be uh, addressed in MIDI units, then what we need to do is after we found the frequency of the oscillator that we want. Okay, so we're going to get the pitch back. Okay, so what's happening here is every time we get a bang in the pole table, we're going to figure out an amplitude. So we're going to then have to get the value of the frequency. You've seen this before in envelope generator controls where you have a delay, but after the delay you want to set something off with a variable message. And the only way to be able to do that is to be able to store the value of the variable that you're going to have to recall after the delay. This is a similar situation where someone gave us the pitch at one moment in time, but someone's asking us to use it at another. And so we use as a float object, which stores the frequency so that we can get the frequency back when we need it in order to compute the amplitude. So frequency is changing only at the moment when we change the values in, in the number box, which controls the, the pitch of the sound, whereas the amplitude is changing on a different clock, which is whenever we go pull the table. All right. So then we recall the pitch, which, uh, yeah, which is in pitch units. Oh, we converted back to pitch here. The frequency, which is in cycles per second or hertz, that's appropriate for talking to the oscillator. But for looking up the amplitude in the table, we should be indexed by mid and pitch, because that was the more convenient way to have the table be arranged. And so we just convert from frequency back to MIDI. So here we have this kind of odd sequence of steps, which you might find more than one place, actually, which is look at a pitch, but change it to frequency, but then multiply it by a partial number and then change it back to pitch. 
there are alternative ways of doing that, but that's that's a, that's maybe the conceptually simplest way of finding the pitch of a partial of a, of a note. All right. Then uh, I'll tell you about this a little later. Um, if whammy bar is zero, that means nothing happens here because we subtract zero. But that's a way of taking the whole table and sliding it backward and forward if we want. Uh, but it's not necessary. So, so we're going to get the pitch back out and we're going to read a, a proposed amplitude out of the spectrum table. And the amplitude is going to be, now it turned out to be a good idea to have a 50 dB uh, throw from the bottom of the table to the top. Why 50? Because 50 turns out to be just a good number between very loud and very soft. 100 is too much. 100 is, is the difference between deafening and inaudible. Whereas 50 is the difference between up and down right, in audio. Actually, if you want proof of that, go go look at a mixer and look at at, at the um, uh, look at the dB scale, and you'll see that they like a throw of about 50 dB as opposed to 100 on sort of standard mixers, typically. So then, what we'll do is, okay, there's the Moses object. If if we get a positive number out of here, now let me show you where that might where that's happening. It's here. So what, what's being said is, if this number is zero or even negative, if I was being sloppy about it, we want to get true zero out so that we can really shut it up at, at one frequency or another. But if it's positive, we want to take that value and consider it as decibels going from 50 to 100. OK, that, what that, why 50 to 100? That's because PD has this sort of informal standard of 100 dB is full blast. That's enforced or suggested by the dB to RMS object, which if you say 100 dB, it will say 1. That's an arbitrary thing. Uh, 100 decibels could be any loudness that you wanted to if you're just talking relative levels. But in PD, the, the convention is to have 100 decibels mean 1 or full blast. So, th so this, these values go from 0 to 50 on the table. So what we're going to do is add 50 to it to get from 50 to 100. And then we're going to convert that into an amplitude, into a linear amplitude, and then we're ready to multiply the oscillator by that to make that the amplitude of the oscillator. So that happens like this. Get back in the voice of the abstraction. Okay, so if it's zero, and that's to say if it's less than one, we're just going to make the amplitude be zero. If it's one or more, then we're going to add 50 to it and, do, and run dB to RMS. So zero comes out true zero, uh, but one will get added 50 to it, and then dB to RMS will give us roughly 0 0.003 minus 50 dB. And so there will be non-zero values ranging from 0 0.003 all the way up to one. In fact, it's not strictly limited to one, because if I drew the table out of bounds uh, above the top, then it would be more than one. By the way, that's, yeah? Um, if you had a negative number, it would still go out this side. It would still give us zero. No. Okay, and then to, to make it sound good, uh, pack 30 or some, some non-zero value to it. Who knows which value is best. And what that does is that will mean that whatever amplitude we computed will, have z will, will become the first element of a two-element message with 30. And that will be appropriate to send line tilde to multiply by. Questions about that? So now just getting back to whammy bar. Oh, so what's happening here is we're going to look something up in the tab read for if we want to, in some sense, slide the table over conceptually, what all we have to do is slide the read point back the same amount we want to pretend this, the table is sliding. So what we would like to be able to do is take the table and move it up or down and, and pitch, which is to say to transpose the entire spectrum, just a good thing to be able to do. And to do that, we simply transpose, in some sense, or we offset the value that we use as an x value from reading into the table. So that is, so what's happening then is, if, if, if the oscillator is playing at middle C, that's all right. But if the whammy bar says 12, that means we look back here. Or if the whammy bar is minus 12, that means we look forward to here before we look it up in the table. And then the result is, that the whammy bar does this to the spectrum. Okay. 
All right, so that's another simple, simplish, uh, uh, whatever you say, it's, it's, it's a demonstration of, of using the abstraction mechanism for making a, a powerful additive synthesis instrument. If you were doing this for real, like you know, making it stage worthy, you wouldn't want to make yourself have to edit the table by hand while, while you were playing. You'd want to prepare a bunch of tables and be able to switch them or something like that. And that would be a whole thing to, you know, to plan out how you really wanted to do it and, and to then learn how to make it playable. So this is, only, this is only a demonstration of the concept. It's not a real instrument yet. Questions about this before I close it and get on to the next thing? Close it, you know, the next thing. Um, let's see. Oh, right. This was an aside. But should I save this? Uh, where? Oh, my. Wrong place. that. And I might need this again later. Oh, come on. Okay, okay so that was, uh, oh, where was I? That was the table spectrum.pd example, and now this is, uh, this is more entertainment than it is actual uh, elucidation. But here's another example of, of uh, using. Oh, let's see. Yeah, right. This is something you've probably heard in Music 170. This is the famous Shepherd. I think it's correct to call this the Shepherd Rise tone. And it doesn't sound like much until you listen to it for a while, then it starts to sound impossible. Um, this is of, of historic interest because computer musicians were able to make this in analog synthesizer. Hackers were not able to make this because it requires accuracy and, and, and uh, control of a level that you can't get out of an analog synthesizer. And, and this is not the world's best shepherd tone. This is just me working in a studio some, one night. Um, uh, what it is 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 a spin on what you saw last time, which is that the table, uh, I, it's not even using a table, but it looks like a bell curve. And then the sinusoidal frequencies are sliding from right to left, if you like, and moving up, or maybe, in, as you heard, it's sliding from, from high to low frequencies and working their way up the bell curve and then back down in such a way that you always hear the descent, but you never hear people disappear at the bottom because they're inaudibly quiet at that point. And furthermore, the, the, the tones are arranged so that they're each an octave above the previous one, so that no matter what you think the fundamental pitch is, or whatever your ear tells you the fundamental pitch is, everybody else is a perfectly good harmonic of it. And so as a result, if, especially if you don't listen to it too carefully and if it isn't too loud, uh, you, you have this perfectly fused sound that sounds like it has a single pitch, except that the pitch is paradoxical. At some points, you have to change your mind about what, what octave you're hearing it at. So that's the Shepard Rise tone. Um, how it's done is basically a, a spin on how it, on, on the other one, but there's more math in it, so I will spare you all the math because it's the same principle. Oh, I did one thing here, but I'll show you this out of the next example rather than this one, which is um, rather than using throw and catch, um, I don't know which of these is better style. You can use throw tilde inside an abstraction and catch tilde outside of it to collect the results of an abstraction. Or you can uh, do what I call a summing bus, or what I think is generally called a summing bus, which is each voice adds itself to all the previous voices so that the output is the accumulation of all the voices one after the other. This is, it's easier to see what's going on when you do this. By the way, here's a reverberator Rev2. If you get tired of all those dry sounds in your in your um, headphones and want a reverberator, grab this guy. 
I'll talk, tell you more about that in a few weeks. Okay, but I'll show you how to how to actually do that in the in the next example because it's simpler. The next example is oh, should I do this? No, I'm going to skip that. There's much to know about samplers. Here's a, here's a design of a somewhat more general sampler than you've seen so far. Um, th the samplers that you've seen so far have been of two flavors, um, one of which was driven by a line tilde object and uh, started with a message that would, that would start reading a, from a wavetable or a, an array from a given point to another point over a period of time. The other flavor that you saw was driven by a phaser tilde, and that was better adapted to looping. This is the sampler that doesn't loop, and it is a, um, it's, it's an elaboration of the idea of the sampler so that you can control all sorts of, of um, parameters that can vary one sound from another. <laughs> so even in, it was even there in what you've seen before, everything except, I think, oh, everything that you see there. Um, it was implicit that uh, you could change the amplitude of the voice of a sampler or its duration. Um, I showed you how to, how to make them turn on and off using a, an envelope generator, but of course that means that you could have parameters that would actually control that as opposed to just sort of specify it in the patch. Um, the start location, or perhaps you could call it the onset into the sample, would be just in, uh, if it was continuous, soft, and relaxing. It's whether you want the word soft or the word relaxing, right? That's the start location. Uh, the sample number, I haven't told you about this, but you can direct uh, tab read for tilde to choose a, a one of a, of a collection of arrays by name by sending it messages. Um, duration, you know, amplitude, you know. So everything else is, is just what it was. Uh, the only thing is, can I scroll? Yeah. Uh, now, how do I, where, is the, where are the messages that do things? Huh. I lost the example messages. Well, we can just do it. Okay, so. Okay, so, so you send to a thing called note, so I will, in order to not, um, in order to not have to, dim to introduce yet another object, I'm just going to say send note and send it something. And the things you send it are, over here they are, oh man, to do this in order to, sorry, I'm just learning this window manager still. Some, oh, I see, do this, ha. Ah. Okay, so we make a message which is a pitch, an amplitude, a duration, and so on like that. So let's just say pitch amplitude duration is going to be 60. Amplitude is in dB, 80. Duration is in second uh, milliseconds. Uh, there's a sample number. There's a look. Uh, oh no, I didn't do that. I've got to stop doing that. Uh, there's a sample number, start location, rise and decay time. Right. So sample number, start time will be the beginning. Rise time and uh, and then stop time. I think I get them all. And nothing happens. Oh, let's do that. And still nothing happens. And let's see if I have to turn this thing on. Oh yeah, look at that. Oh, come on. There it is. Maybe a little more juice. sample. Okay, and here, uh, just to show you what's going on, um, you can change now various things like, uh, okay. uh, here's a different uh, pitch. Uh, I showed you changing the amplitude before. Here's changing the duration. Here's changing the sample number. <laughs> All right, there are two samples in there. 
Uh, here's changing. Oh, let's. Uh, yeah, I'd go back to here. Here's. Um, this is more subtle because this is a bell sound, but I could ask it to play something in the middle of the bell sound instead of the beginning. Two seconds later, and that's the sound. That, you know, the the, the the rule about bells is that the higher partials tend to, to go to fade more quickly than the lower ones statistically, anyway. And so if I go into the bell two seconds, I'll get a sound more like that than like this. Right? Similarly, uh, well, similarly, finally, if I want to change the attack time, say, to a second, uh, then I should make this be two seconds long so you can hear it. Then you get... And same thing with the delay. I could say, make the delay be a thousand milliseconds long. Now make the note be short, like a hundred. And then, whoa, that's interesting. I guess it sounded different, but it didn't sound different enough. Let's make it three thousand long. Yeah. Okay. Uh, while I'm at this, there is always the dollar sign mechanism for doing things like this. Suppose I want to be able to change the pitch quickly, but just leave the rest of the things constant. I do this kind of thing. Whoops. Oh, man. Go away. Go away. Yeah. And now I've got a nice keyboard. Or if, uh, if I had the voice in there, then I could make a thing that played different parts of the voice depending on the number box and so on. Okay, so this is again the message box. This dollar one in the context of a message means the, this value, which is 71, is getting, is getting this thing replaced with it. Okay. Now, without telling you all the gory details, I'll tell you a few of the gory details about how this thing is done. Oh, actually, why don't we leave that? For, yeah, it's not okay. So the first thing to, to note is, oh boy, this is more complicated than it needs to be. The first thing that's happening is we are making ourselves a bang before all the arguments of the message. Okay, so note is coming in here and we're unpacking it. And then we're going to pack something which consists of the note, but we're also going to choose a voice number which will choose which one of the eight sample voices to play. So you've seen this, uh, you've seen this pack and route combination before in the example from February 3rd, I think, uh, where I was doing a polyphonic thing with a, the first polyphonic thing with an abstraction already had this, I believe. Okay, so what, what's happening here is whatever these uh, seven numbers are, we're going to add an eighth number to the beginning, and then we're going to pack it into a message with eight values, and then we're going to route uh, according to the first one. And that is going to be a message for the sample voice. Now, the sample voice, this is an abstraction now, which is just made for this one patch, um, is working by adding itself to the previous one. So this is a summing bus again. And now I can show you what the summing bus looks like. There's a lot of stuff here to look at, but I'll start from this. Here's how you make a summing bus. It's really stupid. You just take whatever came in inlet tilde, add yourself to it. So whatever I had to do to compute the sample is getting added to this inlet, and then it's going to become the outlet. And then if you make an abstraction that's designed like that, then you just stack them up and put them one to the next, and then they add themselves up into the sum of all the voices. All right. So I'm not going to try to tell you how everything in here works because you'll all fall asleep. But, um, but the basic idea is the same as what you've seen before, which is that there's an inlet here which is, oh, which is corresponding to what comes in from the route object, except that's the second inlet. The first inlet is the inlet for the sum bus, the summing bus. Right? So this thing has two inlets and one outlet. This is a signal inlet, which corresponds to the inlet tilde you saw that was the summing bus inlet tilde. And that gets added to whatever it computes, and that goes there. And then meanwhile, in, in here are coming messages, one message per note. And each message consists of 
what was it, pitch, amplitude, um, onset into the no, duration, then sample number, then location in the sample, rise time, fall time. And then using techniques that mostly you know, but using more mathematics than I've uh, thrown at you before, uh, compute messages that you send to a line tilde, and I decided to make this a V-line tilde for reasons that I'll try to explain later. Um, but the basic deal is you just work, you make a patch, and eventually um, messages go to the this V line, which is oh, this V line, which is generating um, um, indices into the tab V4. This V line is making amplitudes, and this V line is getting multiplied by it to control the overall amplitude. There are two amplitude controls here. Okay, and I don't want to give you all the details because it's just going to be too much. I'm just going to show you this is the overall design strategy for these. Things. And, and this is explained step by step in, in the book if you want to see all this in, in gory detail. Gorier detail than I want to do right now. This is about the craft of making a, a decent, good working sampler, which is harder than the sort of basic things that I've shown you so far. Okay. So that's the, so these that pretty much concludes the basic tools for making abstractions and how you use the, the basic mechanisms for doing abstractions, which are the dollar sign mechanism, um, inlets and outlets, and the route object. And then all those objects like send and receive, uh, throw and catch. And the one I haven't shown you yet is the signal version of send and receive because we haven't needed it yet. All right. Now, change of subject. So that's abstractions. Oh, change it before I. Before I change the subject, how's the homework going for Thursday? Or that's another change of subject. Should I show you the homework again uh, and see if there are questions about it? Or I see one nod anyway. Let me do that real quick. Yeah. I haven't been able to think of one. The thing I thought was going to work as an extra credit just sounded cruddy. And then I could think of ways of fixing it, but they all were much too much work to ask you to do, so I ended up not being able to think of what. Okay, um, Okay. so here here it is, just just so you can hear it and see it again. I want to say no. Okay, so we're done with the help browser. Oh dear, am I going to be able to find this now? Okay. Huh. Don't have any files in there. Oh, that's the, okay. That's the wrong place. That's still the wrong place. There. No. All right. Does it work? Yeah. So that is, that is a, it's actually, I think I'd have to go look, but it's, it's driven by a phaser, if I remember correctly. No, no, I didn't do that. I made it dri driven by a line tilde because it was easier to, to figure out how to do it that way. And basically all it is is a bunch of chunks of a sample that are gradually moving forward. <laughs> Frequency and size are how big the grain is, which, by the way, changes the pitch because if you read more of a thing in a fixed amount of time, you get more transposition. And the frequency is, of course, how many of them is going to happen per second. And part of the trick here is you've also got something that can make, you know, can make actual pitches. So this is a fast way to have a lot of fun with samples. But see if you can just get it to do this thing. Because then you already will have made yourself able to do all the rest. Yeah? Okay, that's clear. 
That is for Thursday, and I couldn't think of a good extra credit to ask. The, the extra credit I wanted to ask for was make three of them and have them be in a major triad or something like that. But then when you listen to it, it's just hash. You can't actually tell what's going on. It's too thick, sonically. And you could fix that, but it would require things that you don't know about yet. OK. The, uh, the homework this, uh, for next week, this is, this is looking in the future. Uh, let's see, let's really close this is just a simple exercise, a simple, it's, it's, it's a first exercise about um, polyphonic voice allocation. I decided to try to make something as different as possible from the continuous soft and relaxing. This is, um, this is, uh, this is no more complicated than it sounds like. Um, it turns out that if you play a sinusoid and then make it decay, it, has this sort of wet reverberant sound just because one's used to hearing the sounds of decaying things in reverberant spaces, I guess. So it has this very sort of drippy sound, although that's nothing but just plain old sinusoidal oscillators exactly like the ones I've shown you. If you leave it running, it sounds dry and ugly, but then if you just turn it on and then quickly fade it out, then it starts sounding like this. Except I should say that you can probably tell there's more than one sound happening at once. You wouldn't be able to do this with one oscillator because, in fact, uh, at any given time, there are 10 of these things sounding at once. This is a 12-voice machine that I made for this. So what's happening now is there are notes being generated OK. There's a speed, which is controlled by a metronome. There's a duration, exactly as in the Rissé bell. Right? All right, so now you can make sort of classic computer music sounds. The other thing that was useful, I thought, immediately was being able to change the bass frequency. Okay. And this is actually quite easy to do. It's just conceptually fun. Yeah. It's, it's really it's easier than this last one, I, I guarantee you. Um, oh, yeah. Well. Okay, so, so the metro object takes an argument which is the milliseconds that between things. So really the question would be why is the metronome object designed that way? It's because you can, actually, yeah, it's, it's so that you can get exact, um, exact values out of it. So if you, now, now that I'm saying that, is it not possible to get it? Yeah, because since the scheduler works in units of time instead of units of tempo, if you say, for instance, 1,000 to it, it really will come down once every second. But if you're doing tempo, then if you say, well, 1,000 still could be, but if you said 1,001, what's that a tempo of? It's 59.9 something. Uh, but then it, there would be a round off error. So, uh, so, the, so the fundamental metro object does that simply so that you can do things that are, that are exact and repeatable. Um, why didn't I make this thing do the right thing and be 120 means two, two per second and so on? It's because that would have been making you work harder. <laughs> you can do it. I mean, it's easy to compute what you should feed the metronome to get a specific tempo. You just take the thing and divide it into 60,000. <laughs> and I could explain why, but what that means is 60 should go to one second, which is 1,000, and 120 should go to 500 and so on, so you're dividing 60,000 by the metronomic value to get the uh, to get the milliseconds you feed the metronome, but that's adding another step to the homework that you have to do that wasn't really part of the homework or wasn't part of the idea anyway. So yeah, you can do it either way. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, it'll, okay. Um, the, the one object I haven't told you about that will make this possible, uh, obviously there's a sequence of pitches there. I've, I've shown you how to make repeating sequences, but this is even stupider than that. This is just random numbers. Uh, they are random numbers with a particular range, which you probably can't hear, but it's two octaves. So how would you do that? Uh, that would, this would be a good moment to just show you something. Here's a new object, or a new patch. It'll be at 16 point, OK, and we're going to save it. Not here, but back in the website, so that you'll see it. Uh, 
randomness. Um, all right, so this is an aesthetic fault line in, in computer music. There, uh, the word random or the word stochastic means has, has musical baggage when you use it. So we're going to forget all the musical baggage associated with randomness and just consider this as a technique rather than as a musical statement. Right. So here's how randomness works. You just say random and then give it a range. And then every time you give it a bang in, uh, which I'll just give myself a bang object to do now, out will come a number which is between 0 and 24 inclusive. So that there are 25 possible values. Stupid. Um, usually that's all you do. Every once in a while you have to actually explicitly give it a seed because you want you have two of them and you want them to have exactly the same random sequence as each other. Silly as that might sound, it does happen that you want to do that sometimes. So you can see these things. That's stuff that you can find out in the help window. But 99 times out of 100, just the object itself is what you want. And now, for instance, to make, first off, to, uh, let's see, to make random pitches, do that and add some bass pitch. Oh, right, what does that do? That gives us random numbers between 60 and 84, I think. Inclusive, right, 60, 85, but 84 really because this only goes up to 24. And now that could be something that we feed to MIDI to frequency, and then to oops, and then to an oscillator, and then to a output. And now we have idiot's delight. Right? Yeah. Oh. These numbers coming out of here are uh, range from 0 to 24. There are 25 possible values with 0 is included. And why 25? Because that's two octaves, uh, including the two endpoints, if you're talking chromatic, right? If you're, if you're talking all the keys, not just the white keys. If you want to work harder, figure out how to make this work only with the uh, keys in a given scale. That would be something that I don't want to tell you how to do right now. I, uh, you can use modular arithmetic to do it, but you'd have to actually think about music theory to get there. And that would be a thing. So there's randomness. Oh, and this is randomness the way it sounded in, in the 1960s. And while we're here, it's a good point to mention the existence of microtonality. That's the difference between this, which is an I, oh, whoops, let me do, let me make this just be a musical fifth wide. Okay, so now we have, all right, stuff like that. Uh, that, let me make a nice metronome so you can hear this systematically. And that really wants a toggle to turn it on and off. And I want to, uh, I, I'm doing this so that I can compare it to another thing. Uh, toggle, toggle, toggle. Okay, now if, if you could do it fast enough, you could play a piano. You could play those pitches on a piano because they are all integers. What if you didn't want integers? If you really wanted to sound like an analog synthesizer? You could do this. Now, random number generators in general uh, make random numbers that are integers. Even if it looks like it's making something other than integers, the pseudo random number generator in the computer is really making integers. Uh, so true to that, random really does only make integers. But we can say, why don't we have a random thing that it goes from uh, 0 to 700. And then we're going to divide by 100. Hey, come here. Oh, should I do that or should I make it 800? Let's do 800 just to be... I don't know why. To be simpler. Come here. 
Okay. Now this is the, so random 800 and divided by 100 is the same thing as random 8, except that here a perfectly good value would be 50, and that would turn into 0 0.5, which won't come out of this one. So this now is the diatonic version, and this is going to be the, sorry, not the diatonic, but the chromatic version, and this is going to be the microtonal version. to this, which is, oops, which is cycling back and forth through the same eight pitches over and over again. Okay. So that's randomness and a sort of a, a note about quantization that might inform how you would choose random numbers. Uh, another thing to, to think about, another thing that you might want to do here now that you've got nice random numbers is uh, use a table to have random numbers that are chosen from a set of possibilities that you might have prearranged. And that table you would set up in the same way as you set up the sequencer table from, from many weeks earlier. And then you can choose randomly from a collection of pitches that you chose and could even change dynamically if you want. So now you have easy way to make uh, sort of standard MIDI art kinds of things. Okay, that's randomness. And that's that, that is only there so that you can know how to do this because the only thing that you don't know how to do about this yet is generating all these pitches. And all it was was something like this. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you've got PD extended. Someone wrote another kind of output tilde thing that has a... Um, you have to go get this one, which is inside. Oh, you know what? It, uh, it's on the website. So if you look at the sample patches from any time in the last week or two, there will be one of these. And if you put that in the same directory as the patch that you're working on, that will be ready first, and it will give you one of these instead of the one that you're getting. Oh, and it's on the DVD. Yep. There's probably nothing wrong with the other one. It's probably better. <laughs> okay. All right, so we've done that. Uh, now I'm going to, to shift gears entirely and start talking about modulation. Um, the first thing to know about modulation is this. This is something I've uh, mentioned before, but not really made much out of. So we're going to make this four ring modulation. So ring modulation is the following idea. This is really, really simple, except you can do a lot with it. Take two oscillators and multiply them. Okay, this, so right now we're just recreating something that you've seen already once. Um, so I'm going to make number boxes to set the frequencies. The first one will just be a reasonable frequency for listening to the pitch A, right? so it's going to be 440. And the second one is whatever I give it, which will be medium frequency to change the amplitude. This was like from day one. And then higher values make the sound split. So there are several ways of thinking about this. One of them is that if you you know that if you have two different sinusoids at different frequencies that you hear, they will beat together, at least if the frequencies are close. And so you can think of that as a sinusoid multiplied by another sinusoid. In fact, it's a trigonometric identity. But you can apply it backward. You can take this thing and make it beat by multiplying it by an oscillator. And what that is is mathematically equal to two other oscillators, or two other sinusoids, one at 338 and one at 442. And then if you make this go faster, they split further and further apart until you can hear them as separate pitches. All right, that's a good thing. And the good thing about it is not that you can make two oscillators out of one, because of course you could have done that by adding them, but that you can actually take anything that you want to and do that to it. So for instance, let's see, let's get a, let's just do it live. Whoops, no.
So now instead of the oscillator, I'm just going to use the microphone. Risky choice. And microphone, microphone, microphone. Ah, thanks. Okay, does the microphone work? Oh boy, does it work. Hello, we are talking to the microphone. Now why do we hear that? Because I haven't turned this on. Hello, hello. Hmm. This is not good because I'm not going to be able to do anything else than have myself be heard through the... Okay, there's probably a button here. It's a monitor switch. Let's lose it. Hello, hello. Good. It went away. All right. So now let's turn this to zero. Okay. So nothing comes out because I'm sending sound to the computer, but it's not sending out. The, I had my audio interface on monitor before. And now let's see. We turn this on, and then we should start hearing. Okay. So this is my voice being amplified through the patch. Right. So now I can do anything that I want to to it. In particular, I can make it start beating. So now. I'll start doing this, and then we have, you know, tremolo. So if I give, make a nice long tone, uh, let me get that, right? Okay, so now, now the fun part is, uh, now we've got a nice monster voice from the 60s uh, TV show. <laughs> okay, now what happened here? What happened there was kind of cool. It was that whatever pitch I'm going at ha has not just itself, but it has a bunch of harmonics in it. And if it were just a sinusoid, you would just hear two pitches split off. But in fact, uh, a, a harmonic tone is a bunch of sinusoids. And each one of them is going to get split off, but they're going to get split off by a fixed frequency deviation. And even the, suppose I, I happen to be talking at 100 hertz, which is kind of a typical droning frequency for my voice right now, right? So this thing is going to turn that into 100 plus 53 and 100 minus 53. But then the harmonic, the first harmonic, sorry, the first overtone or the second harmonic at 200 hertz goes to 253 and 200 minus 53, which is 147. So, the, so, the, so if I put 100 hertz in, the original overtones are 100, 200, 300, 400, and then what comes out is 47, uh, 53, wait, 47, no, I don't get 40, yeah, I get 47, and then I get 147, 100 plus 40, no, yeah, and then 153, and then 247, and then 253, and so on like that. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure if this is really 100, but it's, you know, it's not going to be harmonic. It's going to be computer. Right. So, uh, oh, you know what? If I happen to hit uh, twice 53, which is 106, then I get a nice uh, harmonic sound again. Uh, which is a not good down from where I started. Which is cool. But if I want to do that, um, if I want to do that in a, in a robust way, I would have to figure out what the pitch was and constantly adjust the 53. You can do that. I can show you how to do that later. Yeah. That's the other, yeah, that's the other channel, and I'm only running into the left channel on this mic, so there's nothing coming out of it. Yeah. Okay, but then if I give it a different pitch, uh, then you just don't have things that line up in harmonic series, and so you have something that would be more typical of a bell tone, except I can't make a bell sound because I'd have to make my voice envelope like that, and I don't think it's physiologically possible. Um, but it's a but it's a thing that's an inharmonic spectrum as a, as the spectrum of the bell might be. If I took that, I could, uh, if I took that and sampled it and then enveloped it, I could make bellish sounds, maybe or crude bellish sounds, I should say. Okay. This is actually a very general and powerful technique, even though it looks stupid. You just take anything that you want and multiply it by an oscillator, and it takes the frequencies in it and slides them both to the left and to the right. With, um, with very carefully designed filters, you can actually separate the part that slides to the left from the part that slides to the right. But that is stuff from chapter eight. You won't get to see that just yet. 
Um, as it is, it's already pretty powerful. Questions about this? So another example would be, let's, let's make a very simple computer music instrument. Okay, so now I want to make, uh, in the simplest possible way, a sound that has some interesting overtones that's just made out of an oscillator. So we're going to be doing all this stuff again, except I'm not going to do it to my voice, I'm going to do it to an instrument. So let's design the instrument first. The instrument is going to be, we'll take an oscillator and then just act stupid with it. We're just going to clip it uh, between some decent negative value and some decent positive value. Oops. Okay, and now I'll just play that for you so you can hear it. Oh, nothing. Oh, yeah, look at that. That's not going to work. Okay, that's not so exciting, is it? Let's, uh, let's drop this a little bit. There we go. All right, so now what's happening, I showed you this before in a different context. All we're doing is we're taking the oscillator, which is a sinusoid, and clipping the bottom and top. That's a very simple wave-shaping kind of way to make a different kind of waveform. And that, by the way, is... Uh, that's a big topic which I will give you some mathematics about uh, in the next couple of sessions, but right now I'm just going to do that and have it be a nice sound. All right? Now this sound that we have, I want to take and ring modulate. So now we have the same sound, but now the sound that's being modulated. And it's not a very good choice of frequencies. fast way of making inharmonic spectra out of harmonic ones. And this, you know, it doesn't look like much, but, the, but um, if you listen to electronic or especially computer music of the last, especially actually of the period 60s through 90s, uh, this is going to suffuse everything because people got very excited about being able to make inharmonic spectra, having been imprisoned largely to harmonic spectra plus an occasional bell uh, for most of the history of music. So people thought very, people made music theory kinds of thoughts about how these inharmonic spectra could mix and whether they could be, you know, consonant or dissonant intervals between sounds that didn't have pitches but had just spectra like this. And so that's a that's a rich sort of a rich source of, of musical inspiration that was brought on by the electronic and, and the computer music eras. So this is, this is the sort of general direction that we'll go in now. Uh, having, having seen the multiple voice thing, uh, the abstraction mechanism, the next thing is learning how to design sounds using the techniques of modulation and wave shaping, which are represented here by this multiplier and this clip tilde.